once again and welcome to another interview podcast and video here on the Outdoors Station. And tonight, it's a fascinating one. A few years back, I became aware of Tom Langhorn, who runs the wonderfully named YouTube channel Fandabby Dozy. It's a word that if you're of a certain age and you remember the Crankies, you'll remember they invented the word and I think they even had a song called Fan Dabby Dozy. Anyway, he is a outdoors wilderness instructor Bill, uh, based in Scotland, uh, in the wilderness up in Scotland, but he has a particular interest in a certain period of time in Scottish history. And I am addicted to his content that he creates because forget all the videos and discussions about modern day equipment and all the rest of it, this goes back in time and does make you wonder exactly how people survived working and living in the outdoors going back a few hundred years. Why is it of interest? Why is it important? Well, I've been lucky enough to walk across Scotland over 10 times now, and I know many others have done many more um, who also join in with something like the TGO Challenge. And often when I've been going across the wilderness, uh, I have considered that it's pretty remote and how would have people survived? You come across old huts occasionally, which have been long since fallen into dilapidation. And it's a tough life. Some of the bodies that you pass by in the middle of nowhere, it would have been a tough life. So the knowledge and interest that Tom has put into, and the research particularly, he's put into his channel is fascinating for somebody that's interesting, interested in seeing how other people lived, certainly in a certain period of time. So I hope you really enjoy this conversation. Of course, all the links to everything will be in the show notes and on the YouTube channel as well. So here's my conversation this evening with Tom. Well, good evening, Tom. Thanks ever so much for joining me tonight. I think it's going to be a fascinating conversation. I look forward to it. So uh, I've sort of introduced you at the beginning there as a survival instructor, bushcraft uh, wilderness instructor and so on. So let's start with the, the brief introductions to start with and, and what you're currently doing before we get into the juicy stuff. Okay, yeah, so um, my name's Tom. I am self-employed and I mainly make my living around my passion for wilderness survival skills. Um, so I teach courses on it and I've got a YouTube channel where I mainly make videos around the topic um, and yeah what I'm best known for is kind of looking at the topic of wilderness survival skills through the lens of the 17th century Highlander through the lens um, of history so yeah that's a brief brief thing to what I do <laughs> excellent and and that's particularly the reason I've asked you to join me tonight uh, is to discuss I've, I've watched most of your videos I've been just been fascinated by uh, your experimentation and and the uh, some of the activities that you've you've attempted to do or try to do using a sort of historical reference. So, what was the actual start of it? How did why, why the seventeenth century in particular? What was what brought you to that particular era to start your your series of videos? Um, well, I mean, I've been making videos for about ten years. I've only been doing the Highlander series about four. Um, I've always been interested in the outdoors. Um, I think what I was initially, what initially brought me into bushcraft survival was fishing. So I've been fishing ever since I was three years old. My dad was a keen fisherman. Both my parents are really outdoorsy. So, sort of, uh, I grew up in the the central belt of Scotland, but almost every school holiday, my parents were taking us up to the Highlands, um, and yeah, camping, fishing, hiking, canoeing. Um, so that really sparked my interest for the outdoors. And when I was about maybe 10 years old, um, I got interested in Ray Mears. He was one of my biggest inspirations. And yeah, basically uh, spent my childhood running around the woods with a bow and arrow, uh, dressing up as a warrior. And the joke I say is that I'm basically doing the exact same thing I was doing as I was a kid. I'm just now trying to justify it as a job. Um, 
Now, why the 17th century? Well, as I said, I was in the Highlands a lot. Um, so that landscape, that history, that culture was always interest. Um, what kind of got me into Highlander series is actually one of my biggest um, bushcraft inspirations is a guy called Dave Canterbury. He's an American guy. He's written some very famous bushcraft books. He's got a YouTube channel and he did a short series looking at the American frontier. Um, so yeah, around 18th century, what sort of equipment the American frontiersman was carrying. And he did a whole video about a wool blanket um, and just how multifunctional and useful and simple a, a wool blanket is. And, um, you know, so I was kind of watching his channel and then my sister, she's fluent in Gaelic and is really knowledgeable about Scottish history and things like that. And she was just having a conversation with her and she was telling me about the great kilt, uh, you know, the plaid, the plaid uh, that Highlanders <clears throat> were wearing from about the 15th century on into the 18th century. And she was, you know, describing it as just a really big blanket and just something clicked about, you know, me watching these videos about how multifunctional a wool blanket is and then thinking about, you know, how the Highlanders had this massive wool blanket that they used as their, their jacket, their sleeping bag, their main item of clothing and just something clicked. And I was like, that's really interesting. I want to try that out. And so, yeah, so, I mean, that, that idea was in my head for years uh, before I actually started making the videos and then Basically in 2018, I got a job in the Highlands and just things kind of lined up to allow me to do it. I was you know, in the Highlands, I was staying on site right next to this beautiful uh, old forest. Um, I was only working at this job uh, mornings and evenings. I had kind of chunks in the day. I could just run out into the forest and quickly film stuff. <clears throat> so yeah, that summer I just got a bit obsessed with this time period and I just kind of went went out and experimented with it. Um, now, why the 17th century? Um, mainly, yeah, mainly cause um, we know a lot from the 18th century onwards, cause that's kind of when the Jacobite, last Jacobite rising was in. And 17th century to me was an interesting time period because it was slightly less known. Um, so I felt like there was more kind of creative, uh, creative space to explore. You know, there was lots of people already doing Jacobite stuff and I felt 17th century, um, yeah, there was just a, a bit more room to explore. And also the bow and arrow was still being used in the Highlands right up to the 1690s, so right to the end of the 17th century. And I love archery. So it also, I just sort of picked that time period because I felt like I could explore a lot of my interests within it through, through this story of the 17th century Highlander. But as you'll probably see in my videos, I do flip and talk about different uh, different centuries, but generally around the 17th century seemed to be a nice, nice story. Well, thank you. That's a, that's a great introduction. I can see why you, you, you've chosen that now. And I presume really the 17th century, 18th century, that, that era, um, like we just saw there with some of the drawings, you've actually got some reference material to, to work with as opposed to just guessing what, uh, what people were wearing and how they were probably were approaching life as it was in those, those times. And thankfully, as we can all see, you've dressed this evening for us as well in, in traditional garb. Yeah, <laughs> I have. Hi. So... So those drawings in particular are 18th century. So they were drawn in the last Jacobite rising. Uh, but generally the clothing, we know the clothing didn't, hadn't changed that much. Um, so, so yeah, so the references, like these drawings, the, the Pennycook drawings. So yeah, they can give us wee clues. Uh, and we just know just from other references that it hadn't changed too much from the 17th century in terms of the weapons and things like that. And they're, how the plague was still the main garment. Um, really, the only kind of things that changed was that um, these, the firearms were becoming more common, uh, the flintlock firearms. Um, so I... <laughs> Fantastic. So um, you were going to come on to a, a particular trip that you made, which I really, really enjoyed the video. So I must congratulate you on that. It was a, a four-day yeah. trip that you took um with uh, uh sorry a four-day trip that you took with uh using the traditional equipment as you 
thought and compiled and you've been experimenting with for obviously building up to it. So I'm going to run that video in a minute while you talk over it. But before we get any further, uh, I, I know you've, you've got your clothing there. If you'd just like to describe to people perhaps what you're wearing and what it was capable of doing and any other items you might have behind you that, that refer to sort of clothing and, and general equipment. Sure. Well, yeah, I mean, um, the people are interested in the very, very detailed. I've got two videos kind of going through the equipment. Um, but yeah, basically, we know um, that the average Highlander was wearing a, a long linen shirt that was typically going all the way past almost to the knees um, as your base layer, then a sheepskin, um, sheepskin waistcoat, followed by, don't know if I've got an example, here we go, um, a thick wool jacket um, that was over it. And then over that was your, your plaid. Um, so I've got many different plaids, but here's an example. And basically it's just a massive blanket, uh, typically between four and five meters long and about um, a meter and a half wide. Um, yeah, as you see in the video, it's uh, footwear. I mean, there's lots of descriptions of people just going barefoot but the footwear was typically very minimalist. Literally, it's pretty much like a, a leather sock. Yeah, it's pretty much a glorified leather sock, um, often made <coughs> with uh, raw skin with the fur on the outside. Um, yeah, and I've got a video of me making those shoes and I walked those four days with those shoes. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's very, very basic clothing but as i've been experimenting and as i've been you know wearing it out in the in the, in the elements of the of scotland um some things do make sense uh, as we might go into the conversation comparing it with modern stuff there's certainly many modern inventions i'm grateful grateful for but um what's interesting to like literally put yourself in the shoes of our ancestors um yeah, it's uh, some of the clothing starts to make sense in terms of dealing with the Scottish weather. And the did you make all the equipment that you took with you on this on this trip? We're going to discuss. Uh, I made a lot of it. I didn't make um, all of it, so I made the shoes. I made the backpack. Uh, I made most of the stuff within the backpack. My food pouches and stuff are made from cow stomachs, tanned cow stomachs. I made all that. Uh, some of the stuff I didn't make was obviously the clothing, uh, things like the water bottle, uh, obviously the sword, um, some of the knives and things. But a lot of this stuff, if I couldn't make it, I tried to get local craftsmen. So I've got friends who are blacksmiths and traditional tanners and leather workers. Um, so it's kind of the the kit is still evolving. I still can't say it's it's perfect. And um, in terms of like historical accuracy. Again, all I was kind of doing is, is finding little little clues in the historical literature and then basically putting my understanding of bushcraft survival from a modern perspective, trying to find what resources were available to people, and then just doing a lot of kind of experimental guesswork to fill to fill in the gaps. Yeah, I mean, I can understand that. It's and it, it's that's what fascinates me about your series. Really, is is your experience with obviously modern day equipment, and when you run the courses, I'm sure people turn up in modern day equipment, um, and everybody discusses gear. It's an endless, it's an endless joy that we all go through in the outdoors. No. Um, yeah. What have you have you discovered anything that you found to be more effective, traditionally made than modern equipment? Hmm. Um, what I think is that modern gear wins in most cases in the short term. But when you're talking long term or a kind of more self-reliance or more multifunctional uh, terms, then that's when I feel like the historical equipment has something more to offer. Right. And I suppose what goes along with that is also the mental approach as well, because mm. um, as much as when you do a survival course or whatever, a wilderness course, there's obviously an element where you discuss that the mental approach is, you know, 90 percent of mm. 
the surviving part of it, really. Um, yeah. When you're looking at it from a historical perspective, and as you say, what would, would have been around at the particular time f as regards materials or the natural materials, then I suppose the the mental approach, do, you know, do, did you think, mm. did you come to the conclusion that the, the, the 17th century outdoors traveller was a, a, a hardier soul? Certainly. And what I guess is maybe the biggest difference when we're talking about, um, you know, outdoor equipment of the modern day in the past is basically, it's only recently have we accomplished such comfort that we can even talk about the outdoors as something separate, if that makes sense. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. all these outdoor sports like hiking uh, and things really only came after the, you know, industrial revolution and when workers rights came to a point where people started to have free time so and people were living quite comfortably had central heating so therefore they were challenging themselves and going hiking and climbing and things like that where if you look at the, especially the poor person living in the 17th century they're living mm -hmm. in a house with no windows um single fire in the middle um some very poor people may have just had one plate and one one change of linen and they're spending pretty much cons all their time outside um and someone like the drover which is a a, a character is basically a scotch cowboy people who drove cattle mm -hmm. around the highlands that's a, a character i like to look at and these guys are outside all the time so i guess a big a big part of the mentality is just to realize that you know, what I like to say in the Highlander survival courses is back in the day, there was no such bushcraft and survival. It was just called yeah. life. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah. So that's, <laughs> that's a big part of it. Uh, so yes, the mentality. Um, I mean, I think there is stories of, you know, people deliberately, you know, especially young men kind of proving how tough they are by doing, you know, certain climbs and running up to the top of a hill or doing some kind of macho challenge. But you know, life was kind of hard enough, um, uncomfortable enough that, you know, they didn't have to go for a hike to, to feel alive where in the modern day, we kind of have to, because we've achieved so much comfort. Um, yeah, yeah. and again, I mean, another full... aspect of, sorry, yeah. I would say as if it was a full-time job to survive, wasn't it? I mean, to, exactly. to, to eat yeah, and yeah. feed yourself. Person. Yeah. It's just full on from the, from the smallest things from lighting your house to keeping it warm. To making sure you got food, uh, to looking after your cattle, um, that's a full time job. Um, okay, but yeah, but I guess the toughness. It's like so if you think uh, someone has lived in the cold from a young age, their body is going to be more adapted. Their feet is going to be more adapted. So that's another thing. I'm I'm coming from this as someone who's grown up in you know. A modern house and i've been wearing modern you know protective footwear all my life and generally been living in a fairly comfortable house all my life um to then go and experience you know um the elements using the clothing of the past when in the past people would have been living in a you know a non uh, central heated house uh, so potentially people's physiology would have been different and um, so that's a big part a really interesting thing you know, comparing me to how people would have been. Yeah, definitely. And I think also the the uh, Jacobite pictures that you've got there, um, they mm. weren't the most attractive of people. They looked like they'd li they'd led a bit of a tough life. Uh, so <laughs> I, I should imagine they were pretty pretty hardy all round, and they had a, 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 yeah. a face that reflected the weather. I mean, the, the video that's running at the moment <laughs> is obviously one of your winter walks where you were testing the gear before you did your three day. Um, yeah. and, and how did how did the equipment perform in this sort of weather? Because this is typical Scottish spring weather, really. Uh, well, um, fine if you keep moving. I mean, wool is a great is great. You know, wool was still being used right up until really Gore Tex, uh, you know, and synthetic fibers came. Uh, this particular video was kind of right at the beginning of my experimental journey. So my kit is not. It's, you notice I'm still wearing modern boots and things um but but yeah i mean it's obviously the big thing is you'll notice that i'm going bare bare legged uh under the kilt and you know there is 
there is evidence of people wearing trues, you know, some sort of trousers. Um, but a lot of the time, there's lots of references, people just going bare-legged and barefoot, even in winter. Um, so again, uh, you know, it's, uh, from my experience, I find it, it, it works, it works pretty well as long as you keep moving. Uh, and wool is amazing because it swells when it gets wet. And wool, in terms of a, uh, the fabric qualities, it still maintains 80% of its insulative value, even when it's soaking wet. And that, that is still, um, I mean, modern fibers still beat that in terms of lightweightness and things, but wool, as far as I'm aware, is still superior in that way. And then also when you are hanging around the campfire much more, which you tend to do when you're doing bushcraft survival or especially historical survival, is that wool is also fire retardant to a certain temperature. So it means that you can get much closer to your fire and get the most of that heat. And you're not worried about sparks burning holes, which you're not going to do with your new expensive, you know, Gore-Tex jacket or down, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> down yeah. jacket. Check a, check, check a pine log on and watch it spit. Absolutely. Um, exactly. <laughs> the, um, the, the plaid that you've got just out of interest. And as I say, having watched a few of your videos, uh, D would you think no uh, rather than saying did you do you have i'd rather say d would you have thought that the the plaid that they would have had at that particular time would have been a much heavier duty or a tightly woven or coarser material due to i mean although i'm not putting them down i'm sure their skills were good for weaving uh, mm -hmm. and so on at that time anyway but i'm just wondering from a from a sort of practical use point of view a tighter weave would have been a better weave for the plaid definitely yeah i mean i've got about five or six different um plaids that i've been been experimenting with um i've got one or two which i feel are pretty close to what the average person would have had so heavyweight yeah, fine, uh, densely woven. They would have been tr um, treated with a process called walking, which is W-A-U-L-K-I-N-G, walking, which is basically after you'd woven it, you beat it, you kind of soak it and you beat it. And there's all these walking songs. So there would be a circle of women and they're kind of beating the cloth and passing it on. And that beating it is kind of felting it and making it more waterproof. Um, ah. I've also theorized that potentially uh just because it would be dirty and more grimy just from being around a campfire all the time that grime might actually make it more waterproof and also if the wool hadn't been washed using modern fa uh, you know modern washing techniques that they do when making modern fabric potentially it could have contained more lanolin which is the natural oil that the sheep yeah, produces yeah. so yeah so we i mean the only historical pieces of, of plaid we have left are, you know, tiny little uh, ragged, you know, scraps. So we, again, we we don't really know. And I guess there would be diversity. It depends how how wealthy you are. If you're wealthy, yeah, then you yeah, can of course, yeah. afford a bigger one. If you're really poor, it could be a, a plaid that's been passed down three generations and it's full of repairs. So yeah, yeah, yeah. No, fascinating. Well, it's really, as I say, it's it's a great topic to to actually start to think about and and reflect on. Now, um, I'm gonna I want to run this video with your three day trip, and obviously I'll run it silent in the background while you explain the situation. But I think could you just uh, uh, prepare it for us, prepare it for the listener or the viewer, uh, and so he understands what you were doing, what you're attempting to do, and obviously I'll let the video run while you're talking. Okay. Um, so yeah, so basically for this trip, I was interested in the story of the Highland Rover in the 17th and 18th century. So basically the Highland Cowboys, people that were out in the land all the time, experiencing the elements, traveling light, uh, but also carrying weapons to protect the cattle that they were, they were driving. Um, so this expedition, all my, my, uh, previous videos was basically you know, experimenting with the kit and just doing one, you know, one overnight, um, or I think the biggest trip I'd done was a two nighter. Um, so for this particular trip, the, the four day expedition was basically, I wanted to try something longer, um, four days, three nights and try do an expedition across a variety of different habitats. So bog 
forest, heath, mountain. Um, and yeah, basically with all the equipment that I compiled over pretty much four years of, of work. Um, so yeah, uh, that's, that's basically what, what the trip, what the trip okay. was. Okay. Uh, and just, uh, as an additional thing, because modern day, uh, hikers and bushcrafters will be interested. What do you think was the actual weight of all the equipment that you were carrying? Did you manage to break it down at all? I did. Uh, so I do have a video uh, where I break down all the equipment and it was actually turned out all in all 12 kilos, which including, is often... Including the food? Including the food and including the sword. It was about 12 kilos, uh, wow. which I was surprised about. Um, I mean, again, my video where I break, it, uh, break down and talk about the, all the equipment I took I did say uh, I was cold two out of the three of the nights. Um, but then again, this is where we've got to look at look at it in a different way. Because if we look at it from a modern way that you might go camping, so say I have my backpack, it starts to get dark. You know, I set up my camp a few hours before it gets dark. I kind of fall asleep and have, unless, you know, I'm trying to get up early to do another hike. Generally, you know, you're going to sleep for your standard eight hours that you would probably still do it back at home. You get up, you pack up and you leave and you make sure that you've got lots of layers and you've got a lovely uh, down sleeping bag. When using this equipment, uh, the lightweight equipment, I, I didn't bring an extra wool blanket in my past trips. I would bring extra wool uh, blankets to sleep in this. I just had my plaid. Um, so <clears throat> what I found was I could fall asleep and sleep until the coldest part of the night. So, you know, kind of four or five in the morning. And then I would get very cold. And what I had to do was just get up and start moving. And then I would walk until midday, the sun would come out and then I would have an afternoon nap. And actually, as I did this, I just thought, well, maybe this makes more sense. You know, these guys, they weren't on a camping trip. They were working, they were looking after cattle and they were basically, having to drive herds of cattle from the highlands all the way down to the central belt or sometimes to England. And, you know, they had to avoid main settlements because, you know, they're driving hundreds of cows. You can't just drive hundreds of cows across people's fields and in villages. You have to take kind of indirect routes, more kind of wild routes. And, you know, these guys were working. So they, you're kind of, you're just catching, catching a nap when you can kind of thing. Uh, while your mate is probably staying up to keep an eye on the cattle because there was bandits, there was people trying to steal cattle because it was a main, you know, form of economy. So, you know, I, living like this or li living this for four days, I just realized that actually a big part of traveling light is changing your behavior, changing just when you move. So just move when you're cold and sleep when it's warm. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that makes uh, that makes a lot of sense. Uh and as you say, I mean there's not a vast amount of difference to to doing the same thing today. Um if mm. uh, yeah, as you say, once you start getting cold, you start moving and start trying to uh, to to heat yourself back up again. Now the the food that you used on this particular trip um and took with you, you obviously try to keep as traditional or as authentic as possible. What sort of diet right. were you on? <laughs> Uh, lots, lots of oats, <laughs> lots of oatmeal. Um, so basically, uh, so oats was the main carbohydrate of the Highland, mainly cause it was too wet and cold to grow, um, wheat barley was also important. So, um, when, you know, researching what sort of foods people might take on a journey, the main two ones that were coming up was oat cakes and, uh, bannock breads. And they're both, they're both pretty similar, to be honest. You're ba it's basically an unleavened bread. Um, so that was kind of my carbohydrates. And um, I was also bringing, for protein, I brought, uh, uh, what was it? Smoked deer, so smoked venison. So that was my protein. And I also had a wee flask of whiskey, which you see, <laughs> see in the video. So, um, so that was pulled from some direct historical resources in terms of the bannock breads and the oat cakes. We know people are carrying that. We know people are carrying whiskey, typically in a little uh, flask made from a sheep's horn, made from a ram's horn. And um, 
yeah, I kind of filled in the gaps with what I've read as, you know, I knew people were smoking fish. I guessed people were smoking and drying meat. Um, so yeah, so, and again, I kind of put my modern approach to the historical side. So in the video, you'll see that I made food parcels. Um, so basically uh, wax wraps and I had four, one for each day. And in it, I had every day, I had two bannock breads, which were about this big, uh, two oat cakes, and then a ration of um, dried deer. Um, oh, and I also had a trail mix of dried blueberries and pig nuts, which is a tuber that, that grows wild. Um, and again, this is something that I was doing a bit different to my past trips. In my past trips, I was kind of would bring just a little bit of food, just oats, and then I was trying to get food from the wild. But then if you're doing that, you have to spend most of your time <laughs> trying to get food from the wild, trying to fish and trying to forage. Um, so for this expedition, that four day expedition, I wanted to mainly focus on the journey and make sure that I have enough food. But, um, but again, I, I was surprised. I was surprised by the food. Um, it's, I got a bit bored of the taste. It generally, it's very bland in comparison. Um, but I was surprised by how much energy it gave me. And it's actually given me some inspiration that I think I could bring into some of my modern expeditions food -wise. interesting interesting and so so uh, i mean obviously when doing something like this it's a massive learning curve so so oh, yeah. what did you uh, what surprised you what was the thing that did surprise you that you learned thinking actually i can see this really works and uh, and, and what did you come away with thinking no this is definitely wrong that this i've got to i've got to get this changed um so I think what I felt was wrong was the layers. I think I did either need a, a thicker plaid or an extra wool blanket. Um, and I say that in the, in the video where I break down all the equipment. Um, now I did this expedition in midsummer, So I was mainly thinking about overheating. So I wore a, a kind of medium weight plaid uh, that's slightly shorter at four meters. Um, and yeah, I didn't bring an extra blanket. So I, I was thinking I wanted to be as light as possible. And I was thinking about overheating, but that first night, uh, on the moor, it actually went down to five degrees Celsius, which, uh, you know, pretty cold <laughs> for midsummer. Um, and yeah, I was really wishing I would brought an extra blanket. So what I'd quite like to try is either wear a, a bigger, thicker plaid or bring an extra wool blanket. And I'm probably tending to the extra wool blanket just because it was getting hot during the day. And I was glad, I was glad during the day that I had my, my light um, plaid on. So that's probably something I'd change, something about the layers. Um, I guess what a surprise in a way was the footwear. Now, um, yeah, uh, I, I had to bring a spare pair of shoes, which um, you see in the, expedition and I had to swap them over. Um, but again, these shoes, very simple, literally just a leather sock. Uh, but in the past, you know, there was no roads in the Highlands until the last Jacobite rising, basically General Wade, uh, a general for the British army was building roads in the Highlands so that the British army could move their artillery. That's kind of the first hard roads there was in the Highlands. It was mainly just dirt tracks. And um, so that footwear is fine for the dirt. And in fact, you know, I was doing this with my friend Finn, who was filming and he was wearing modern equipment. Um, he's a, he used to be a gamekeeper. So he's used to walking around the hills, you know, hunting deer. And he was wearing these, you know, big, chunky, modern boots. Um, and actually, you know, my shoes, sure, they got wet. I got soaked through almost instantly, but because they're so soft, they're literally just a leather sock. There was nothing, there was nothing to rub against. There, I didn't get any blisters. And all I needed to do was have a nap in the sun and put my feet up towards the sun and they would dry off, you know, within 10 minutes. Where Finn, walking in his modern boots, uh, sure, he was fine for a bit, but then once they got wet, they stayed wet and they 
had this, you know, big solid um, support that rubbed his feet. So he actually had the bail on day three. He had, he had to go back. Also, he was carrying a lot, lots of equipment. He was carrying much, much more than me because he was taking the filming equipment. But um, that was a surprise. And actually, if I was doing, you know, walking across bogs, I can actually see the advantage of these simple shoes. Now, as soon as you start going up to the mountains and you want to, you know, dig in on steep slopes and you want to make sure that you've got protective ankle support, okay, I'm going to be tending towards modern footwear. And then you'll see when I start walking on modern roads, then my historical footwear, footwear fall apart. But I was surprised that actually, if I had to do it again across many bogs, I would probably go back to the historical footwear in that environment. Interesting. Well, I've, I, I'm not a fan of, of boots anymore. I changed to lightweight footwear a long time ago. And ever since then, I've had virtually zero problems with my feet and also really enjoy the hiking. Whereas with, with boots, I feel like you're, you're swinging this big weight at the bottom of your leg and, and it leads exactly. you where you're going as opposed to where you want to place your feet. So, I mean, you're obviously yeah. they were ahead of themselves, the, the whole uh, minimum <laughs> footwear, barefoot uh, approach, weren't they? Yeah. That's, that's, that's brilliant. Um, so the uh, the other video that I wanted to just touch on was obviously the weapons. Um, you, you've done a bit of research on this, and they look a fairly fairly lethal uh, pile of equipment that you've you've managed to gather. Um, have you have you had information from any museums or or, or whatever about the the accuracy of the weapons that you've made? Yeah. So I mean. We're lucky that uh, the weapons are quite well recorded, uh, mainly because of the Jacobite Rising. So the first Jacobite Risings were beginning at the end of the uh, 17th century. And then, you know, this video, when I'm talking about the Pennycook Talkings, talking about the last Jacobite Rising. So we've got plenty of evidence um, about the weapons, uh, plenty of eyewitness accounts and sketches. And these sketches were actually you know, drawn by an eyewitness person living in Pennycook, which is near Edinburgh, um, as the Jacobite army was invading that area. Um, so yeah, so we know, we do know quite a lot about the weapons. Uh, what we don't know a lot about is usually the more boring side of life, the, the mundane things that people thought couldn't be bothered recording because they thought it was so obvious, which is quite funny. <laughs> Yeah, there certainly were a serious piece of equipment, and then that's obviously the the witness to rebellion is the book to that people refer to. Uh, the other thing that I um, obviously the people that have been to Scotland have experienced the joys of Scotland uh, that has to offer. In particular, at the moment, it's not uh, not going when you're going to get murdered by by the midge and, and the tick. How um, I mean, I suppose the, the the tick explosion has been much more of a modern thing. I don't think it would have been as bad in the in the seventeenth century, or, or I'm assuming it would have been as bad. Potentially, yeah. yeah. But um, I, I I've got the uh, video ready where you use the plaid as a tarp uh, <laughs> to show how effective it yeah. is, and there's some clips if I can find it while I'm talking in there where you can see the midge and the amount of them as you're setting up camp. Oh yeah. Gosh, that must have been murder. <laughs> yeah, it was quite bad. Um, again, de midges were definitely a thing of the past. Um, and yeah, so in terms of dealing with it, with the historical equipment, um, there's a lot of basically you just got to suck it up. Um, and you can, I feel you can become a bit um, sensitized to it. Uh, you can use a plant called bog myrtle, which you can rub on you which does something, but the most effective thing is fire smoke, which you see in this video, I'm getting murdered, it's getting worse and worse. And then just uh, just as I'm trying to get my fire lit, um, yeah, is the worst of it. Um, but as soon as I get my fire lit, then they, they seem to uh, go away. But yeah, no, the midges are still, still a big thing. Um, yeah. But Tell you us just, about you your, your, your bed. Dealing with it. Yeah, tell us about the the, the bedding yeah. you you as of this video is running because I th I found that fascinating. There's the midges there. If people can see that on the video. Yeah. Look at them; they'd eat me alive. <laughs> um, but you you obviously pulled up some moss there and lay the uh, I presume it's a deer skin on it. 
It's a sheepskin. Yeah. Sheepskin. And and how comfortable was it that night? I mean, you must have been bitten to death. <laughs> Very comfortable. I mean, to be honest, what is great about the plane? Uh, so the downside is having your leg exposed. I mean, you see in a lot of my videos, I wear linen trousers underneath it, which there's a bit of evidence that people are doing that. Um, so that at least protects protects your uh, under kilt from the from the biting insects. Um, but actually, when you go to sleep, it's fine because you can fling the the plaid right over your head. And, you know, unlike a modern bivy bag where you get condensation and it feels like claustrophobic having that, you know, waterproof material right in your face, because it's, um, because it's wool, you don't get condensation and it's really breathable. Um, so it just works like a midget net. So actually, as soon as you decide you're going to sleep, you just fling, fling it over your face and the midges stop bothering you. So it wasn't too much of a problem then? No, no, not at all. Not sleeping all in between. <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> then once you got a fire going, if as long as you're near the smoke and you can feed the fire certain things, uh, like decomposing wood, um, you know, produces more smoke and you can use that to keep keep the bugs away. And I, I guess really that over a period of time, the, the, the plate would have been, had quite a smoky um, atmosphere attached to it anyway, which would have obviously yeah. all helped with a little bit of um, yeah. a little bit of encouragement not to, uh, to to I I get absolutely bitten to death by the midge absolutely bitten so yeah. I looked at that and my <laughs> skin was crawling it really was <laughs> well it happens on the expedition as well and uh, another thing people would have worn was a linen scarf and that was okay to fling over your head just to get just to get going but again it's kind of like you change your behavior so you keep moving and if they're really bad, you light a fire. And if they're really bad and you're just going to go to sleep, you just fling your plate over your head and just escape them. Right, right. Well, I think we're sort of coming to an end, really. Is is there anything else that you, you feel you want to experiment with from the same era that, that you feel you haven't quite got, got right yet, that there's something you need to do a little bit more research on? Um... I mean, it's endless, to be honest. Uh, I still feel like I know nothing and... Uh, yeah, I still feel like there's a million things I want to try. Um, what I'm yet to try is something in the winter months. And also, there's two references that I found in the historical literature of Highlanders deliberately wetting their plaid to make it um, wind windproof. Right. Now, this doesn't make sense to me, but there's there's two It's completely separate references of it happening. Um, which the only thing I can think of is basically it causes it to swell and potentially, if you're in freezing conditions, it might freeze and basically create a shell. Um, oh, so, okay. I want—I need to have a safety buddy there in case I get hypothermic. But that is something I am working my way up to: is basically in winter conditions, deliberately wetting the plaid. And what about um, up in it. would they would they have had a plaid and waxed it at all, or used beeswax or anything like that to give it some some uh, water resistance? As far as I'm aware, um, I've got a video actually talking about this, um, an older video. I haven't found anyone of deliberately, deliberately uh, treating their plaid. But as I said, with theories about they might have had more lanolin and because they might just be more grimy um, just from life, then it was probably more waterproof. But no, I haven't found any evidence of people deliberately um, treating mm. their plaid with anything. Well, Tom, it's been absolute joy to speak to you. Let's uh, let's make sure we get some some promotion and publicity in here. Um, if you want to to follow Tom, there's a couple of good places. The uh, obviously good old Instagram. Uh, he goes under yep. the name. I didn't really mention it at all um, at the beginning, but he does go Fan under Dabby the Dozy. fabulous name of Fan Dabby Dozy. And anybody who remembers the Crankies will know that was uh, that was <laughs> a word invented by then, but it's stuck. So. Uh, so that's definitely yeah. the case. So um, it's uh, Fan Dabby Wilderness on Instagram and then Fan Dabby Dozy on YouTube. And there, of course, yeah. you can see uh, are all the videos that he's made. And uh, it certainly is, is entertaining and, and thought-provoking, I have to say. Extremely thought-provoking. Uh, so, so, Tom, one final question. Thanks ever so much for, your, for the time this evening. But if there's anything that I should have asked you or I could have asked you about this particular subject, what should I have asked you? 
What should I have asked you? You should have asked me. Uh... <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, well, that's at least that's honest. That's honest. That's a difficult question. Things. I think you, you ask it. You ask good questions. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, you take care, Tom. Thanks very much indeed. And um, I, I'll, I really hope people start, um, or um, your audience increases from, from this interview. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Cheers. Well, my thanks once again go to Tom for taking the time this evening to discuss in great detail and with great enthusiasm his subject matter, 17th century Highlanders. Now, I hope that, like me, you feel you've learned a bit from watching his videos. Uh, I found it quite stimulating and it certainly makes you think about the multi-use uh, purpose that you have for every item you carry with you to keep the weight down. And it was interesting to hear the actual weights of the packs and the contents of everything, including his weapons that he was carrying, that uh, it didn't exceed a normal day pack. Uh, or a lightweight backpack, shall we say, in modern day terms. And it also perhaps reminds you that they were pretty tough in those days. Uh, like I say, seeing the midges attack him during that, uh, that overnight camp was just, must have been a nightmare. They would have bitten me to death, but I'm, I'm interested to hear his logic. It sounds good to me. Anyway, I do hope you've enjoyed it. Do look him up. Uh, I'm sure you'll be as fascinated as I am when you actually go through some of his content. And stay tuned. Uh, of course, if you have chance, please write a review on Apple Podcasts. Just Google Apple Podcasts and you can uh, enter the name there, the Outdoor Station, to write a review, and I'd be very grateful. So until next time, folks, and the next fascinating conversation, take care out there and bye for now. Mm -hmm.